Welcome back, Time Crunch fans. I'm your host, Coach Adam Pulford, here alongside CTS coach and America's Cup athlete, John Kroom. John, welcome back. Hey, yo. Thanks for having me. I'm stoked to be here. Yeah, man. Well, last week we heard your story about transitioning from a team sport background uh, and being a big dude to becoming an elite track cyclist, which requires a high level of both endurance and anaerobic capacity. So I'd like to talk... Uh, to you today, first defining what anaerobic capacity is so our listeners have a solid grounding of what we're actually talking about, and then explain the benefits of having more anaerobic capacity, even in, if they are a time-crunched athlete. Okay, so let's dive in. Uh, but I, I would say, just from my coaching standpoint, I don't think that we can really talk about anaerobic capacity before we talk about aerobic capacity. Would you agree with that? I do agree with that. And it's funny because it, it isn't something that I agreed with in the beginning. Um, and so uh, luckily I've been, I've had the opportunity to work with many coaches and many different people. And um, I was uh, early days of my career. I was very specific. If you do a one minute effort, you train a one minute effort, right? It's like, it just makes sense. And And I went down this pathway for the longest time. And um, started to see a stalemate. And obviously, you know, with some sort of consistency, you're going to get better. Um, but I just I just started to see it stale out. Um, long story short, I ended up switching coaches. And we just took all the VO2 out for a little bit. Just get rid of it. Just go ride. Um, and it, it was good because it honestly kind of just like, one, it disconnected me with a little bit of that... Uh, that need to like specificity, like the yeah. over specificity. And yeah. Just just ride. No, no, no near no like time really spent um stressing out about um spending time in a zone mm -hmm. and, and and over that threshold and and honestly it's it's very fatiguing. Um it can be, right? Like it can it can be very tiring uh, on the body, especially if that's all you're doing. You say um, intensity, but, like if you're just like chasing yeah, that specificity and, and, of intensity. Yeah, if you're just yeah. if you're just chasing that specificity of intensity day after day after day, um, it can get it can get pretty fatiguing. And so we went to this kind of lower intensity, build the aerobic base to um more or less give me that capacity to do more of the anaerobic. So it's it's kind of a double edged sword. Mm -hmm. Um in the in the grand scheme of things, it's uh we're building this essentially that engine mm -hmm. that you can start putting the supercharger on. Um, and the bigger the engine is, I guess the bigger the supercharger, I'm not much of a car guy, but there's my uh, second crazy analogy for the day. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's a good analogy. And I think that um, the way I would put it is building your aerobic capacity builds all capacity because it's, it's building your potential for that anaerobic capacity specifically for sure. in the way of mitochondrial development, right? If we go out and ride our bike, uh, aerobically and we do it enough for a long period of time where it stresses our bodies the mitochondria that's the energy system of the cell right it has a lot of atp the yeah. more mitochondria you have the more atp you have then all of a sudden we're going to work into the anaerobic capacity which all relies upon atp and so i think that like what's cool about the here and now is that endurance zone two training it's it's getting its hype cool finally because high intensity i think was a little too hypey for a bit but it's the yin and yeah. yang. Like we need both put together. And I think your story and your journey was a little bit of that too, where you were overly For focused sure. on the anaerobic, swung to the aerobic, and then you had this time period of elite uh, com competition where you kind of had both, right? For sure. I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, mixing it up a bit and the timing. Like the timing is so key. I think like timing the right base phase into that, I guess, VO2 phase per se, um, whether, whether you're doing even threshold work, right? Like you, you're timing all of these blocks specifically. And, um, with a lot of my athletes, we'll look at the meta cycle. So we'll look at that big, big picture game, but I really love the meso cycle parts, um, and breaking it down and setting goals within those, um, to help target the overall end goal. And so along, along with that, it, you know, lies that VO2. And I think timing it towards the event is really, really key because getting the most of that loading while also 
limiting that fatigue, whether it's close to an event or not, um, is, is really key. Yeah. And I think the timing, if anything, cause what we're going to do is just kind of like impress the need of aerobic training on everybody. And I think I have overdone that on this podcast because I think, you know, this sport that we do is aerobic in nature and we need the aerobic base to do that. But I guess, well, it, go ahead. It's funny. You sent me the notes of this yeah, and it was like, Hey, I want you to talk to me about all this anaerobic stuff. And it's like, well, I mean, really it's the aerobic stuff that gets me, allows me to do the anaerobic stuff. And it took me a while to figure that out. But once you build, like it, it, it just opens the door for you to take on that much more of that anaerobic exposure. Yeah. yeah and I'd say for those, like the boring answer of how to build aerobic capacity, I'm not going to lie. It's, it's, it's doing the hours, it's consistency in training, which you talked about. You need to be very consistent. It's progressive overload in training stimulus, the combination of aerobic and anaerobic, right? The yin and yang. Um, and then yeah. testing to make sure that we're progressing along the way, which we'll get into. But I would say to yeah. not like, I've done podcasts about this. See episodes number 128, which is should time crunch cyclists do aerobic base training? That's a good one. As well as episode number 46, which is periodization and training modalities with Tim Cusick. And we go through like the micro cycles, the meso cycles and everything that John was just talking about. I'd say in the grand scheme of, of things today and to be that fast facts of the time crunched athlete, let's press into anaerobic capacity, assuming that we have done our aerobic base training quite well. Um, now, just the realities of a time crunched athlete is we don't have the luxury of progressive overload and long training days. So we're going to have to cycle this thing um, to do it well, to get that aerobic base up. But when it comes to anaerobic capacity, my definition that I'm pulling from, from various articles, John, it will see if you agree with this, but I would say best definition I found was the total amount of ATP used by the body in short duration, maximal effort activity. Yes. Yeah. But isn't that like a weird definition from like, it is a weird definition. And and, and honestly, it's funny because you're you're saying it. (laughs) Well, I might get, I might get next for this next comment. Like I, I, I struggle with VO two zone. Um, like it's a hard one for me. It's like, oh hey, I'm training in a VO2 zone. So like, what do you mean? Like it's that's your ma- like that's the maximal sustained effort of like like if you if you haven't depleted the oxygen in that system, you're not at VO2. So and I'm not saying that it necessarily needs to be this like peak and fade situation. Like this is where that anaerobic system comes into play. Um but it is something that I battle um, with many coaches and, and many podcasts, because it's like, oh, if you're just in that, you know, let's say your 20 minute is X and that gives you the Y that you is your threshold. And then you create this one through five zone sheet and five is being your VO2 or four being your VO2 or whatever. And, and that's your VO2. And you train on the low end of that VO2 because you're like, oh, I'm hitting VO2. It's like, are we depleting that system enough? And, and so when, when I, when you read that definition to me, it's like to the max, that's why I'm agreeing with it. What would be, because the reason why I, like, I agree with that definition, I think it is good, but the disconnect I have with it is the total amount of ATP used by the body. Mm. I think that when we're talking about ATP conceptually, most athletes, when they read articles, when they're talking to their coach, maybe they're like, cool, got it. But it's, it's unrelatable. So because that high energy adenosine triphosphate molecule is, I mean, that's everywhere. It fuels everything that we do all the time. And then just so happens that in really short, uh, fast movements at maximum capacity that we use that, but it's very quick depletes away. And then we have to recycle it into different, um, metabolic pathways. So what is a better working definition that you might use with your athletes when you're trying to develop anaerobic capacity with them? How would you tell them what it is? I mean, honestly, that's a, that's a hard one for me. I think with, with an athlete, like I would tell them because without getting too, too in depth and going down, I think it, it is literally when you have depleted oxygen from the muscles and we are using carbohydrate as fuel, like we've crossed over and we're no longer using 
fat and fat burning is fuel. Like we, we are going into burning carbohydrates, which then is going to produce lactate as a response. How about you give me your analogy of the mag- the bullets in the magazine? Yeah. About that. Oh yes. Yes. Yeah. So like, and, and, and honestly, like in, in layman's terms and simple terms, like it is creating a magazine and where you're able to create more bullets um, and, and put more bullets into a magazine. So you're, you're adding the, the bigger you can create that magazine, the more bullets you have. And I think that is where the, the anaerobic or the, uh, yeah, the anaerobic capacity comes from, you know, whether it's bullets in a magazine or matches in a matchbook, it's those moments that are spicy, fiery, um, attacking, sprinting, those maximum, very hard, short-term efforts. This is what we're talking about with anaerobic capacity. Yeah. And honestly, I think, I think even more, it's like, it's like when the mistakes happen, when the things you've, you've missed, I think, I think it's, it's really anaerobic capacity is also good for a fail safe. And what I mean by that is like in a race scenario, you know, if you have a guy that goes up the road and you feel like, Oh, can I jump across to that? Um, and you might've already burnt some matches and burnt some of those bullets trying to, trying to get across or doing something else or whatever. And you've just missed the move. The amount of times that, are, and I bet there's people listening to this like, man, I've been that guy that have just missed the move. And you're like, that's it. Yep. That's it. It's gone. And so you, what you're doing is you're trying to create that moment to where that can't go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you're able to close that. Yeah. And I think, you know, what you just described there too, reminds me that, it, you know, as coaches, it's, it's important to recognize that we kind of have two ways that we talk about anaerobic capacity and it is confusing, but we talk about it as a one-time effort, meaning all out sprint, just go full send all the way to the finish line. But it's also repeatable efforts because we talk about anaerobic capacity being, can you go over and over and over and over again? And we, we there, there's a certain amount of anaerobic capacity that goes on with that. So that's how, that's our, like our language when we're communicating with athletes. Yeah. But I think when it comes down to the measurables for me, and when, when we look at the science of things, it truly, when you're measuring it, it truly is only that one time maximum effort that we're talking about that bullet or that match. Okay. And then there's a certain amount of pacing yeah. that goes on with the, the repeatability of it. So yeah, in our conversation, we'll talk both about like the one time effort, and then there's going to be some repeatable stuff to it. Um, and I think it's also important for our listeners right now to recognize the need for both of those, because John, you know, to you, like, why is this important when it comes to performance? Yeah. I think there's several things. The, the, the reason why this is important, I mean, it goes back. I mean, when we're talking about performance, um, I mean, in a race scenario, it kind of it literally goes back to what I was just saying. I mean, it gives you the opportunity as a fail safe and, and to create those situations yourself. So to be the guy that's constantly attacking and making moves and, and able to shake the race up that, that makes a difference. Um, cause it can break the field, um, break the breakaway. It could, it can make a big difference. Um, it also changes the dynamic of the effort. Um, it, you know, it's one thing to, sit at a steady state effort for a certain amount of time. But if you're able to undulate that steady state effort, that, that creates that, that differential. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then, I mean, again, like, why is it, you know, from a performance standpoint for a time crunch athlete too? Um, I mean, the amount of fatigue that you can create, um, and the amount of response that you can create for, for your training, without little impact on like doms and, and soreness, I think is huge. And, and I think that's where I get really excited about um, anaerobic stuff with, uh, with my time crunch athletes and performance, because, you know, it's really easy to be like, oh, you know, like try these climbing repeats. And, you know, obviously that race that you're training for is going to have these 12 minute climbs, but the the amount of muscular depletion and you know my favorite thing is is when you talk about zones right everybody disregards the lower end of it and they're just like oh "Oh, if i can't 
if I can't hit the top end of that zone, I'm yeah. just not able to hit it. Yeah. And so it's like the zone doesn't exist unless you're at the top end of it. Right. Um, but anyways, that's a whole nother yeah, conversation. Totally conversation. Yeah. Um, it kind of, it kind of unleashes that cap and allows that athlete to kind of, you know, tickle above it. And they also understand that eventually it's going to kind of go down mm-hmm. as we, as we go through it, because you're depleting the system. That's the whole point of it. But sometimes when you're looking at like, Oh, you know, I'm doing climbing repeats at 300 Watts and my range might be from 275 to 300, let's say. And their last one's at 275. That might be a little bit more discouraging. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and when it's like, Oh, you still had the time in the zone. And so, it, it's got a, like a little bit of mental performance as long as well as that actual performance, I think personally. Yeah. And I, and I think for anybody listening here is like the, the, the case for anaerobic capacity is because fun is fast. Fast is fun. Even <laughs> That's if you're, a good even one. Even if you're not racing, yeah. right? Like for sure it's group rides, it's riding with your buddies. It's taking the town sign sprint, like going fast is fun. For sure. And on top of that, like when a hard hill comes and the, you know, say the group goes over or you need to go over and just get your butt over that thing, having more anaerobic capacity is going to have those matches in your matchbook or the bullets in your clip to fire off a few rounds and not hurt as bad. So you won't yeah. suffer as much. And, and yeah. so you'll have options kind of like what you're talking about. Like when a race gets more dynamic, you have more options rather than just like suffer and hope for the best. This is one of those, another one of these coaching things that um, might get me in a little bit of trouble. Um, while I do find threshold is a very, very, like it's a thing that needs to be trained and, and worked on. But I think there's just so many other ways you can build your threshold without having to train threshold. Like, like specifically, like you don't necessarily need to ride at threshold for X amount of time to increase your threshold. I, I, I think you can you can do this base and do some VO two work and actually still increase your threshold. And you never even like actually tried to increase it. And, um, I think that exposure to, to that over threshold work, like over threshold power is, is so valuable, um, because it's just so different and, um, and learning how to pace that as well is also another thing. Yeah. And and I think, Along those lines, I mean, it's like those other podcasts that I've done where I mentioned it goes through, if you're the meticulous planning out, I like to do intervals sort of athlete, that'll get you there. That's not the only way to get you there. Okay. And as John is saying, you can, you can ride a bunch and then at some point go harder and you're going to get better that way as well. But if you want like a, a pretty direct systematic approach um, being able to test yourself from the anaerobic side of things, anaerobic capacity, the aerobic capacity onward from there, that I would say is a more f- like foolproof way of at least recognizing that you are progressing as opposed to just kind of like yeah. riding a bunch and hoping for the best. Um, which yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll admit, like I don't do a ton of intervals because I do enough group rides. I get sucked into a long ride every once in a while with my, with my friends and I don't plan a lot of stuff out, but I know yeah. that because of the people I'm riding with, that'll get taken care of. However, if, for sure, if I didn't have my network of friends, I would just sit behind this computer, do podcasts, write training programs, and I would not be as fun of a rider as I am. like for me fun because I have yeah, options yeah. right um so in yeah. that way like I'm trying like yes I agree with you and training zones whether it's a you know a five zone three zone 15 zone whatever you're using I, I've said this on the podcast before training zones were meant for more descriptive ways of describing how a workout went or how a ride was it, it wasn't intended yeah. to be prescriptive So I do agree with you on that, John, for sure. And high end, low end, whatever our athletes always do high end. Yes, I agree. Um, (laughs) But to your point though, when you said, okay, you ride and then you go hard, like you go anaerobic and there's going to be some benefit there. Yeah. How do you, how do you test that in your athletes or like, how do you test that in your athletes and make sure that that is progressing properly or in the way that you want it to? kind of it kind of depends on the athlete and 
kind of what they're what they're shooting for, what their goals are. Um, obviously, there's always these like little little numbers that athletes latch onto, right? Like my max power. Like what's my max power? Then what's my thirty second power? And then one minute, and then five minute is usually like the upper range of like that. Those are those kind of like VO two ish numbers that people are kind of looking for. Um, now that being said, like with a kilo guy, what I would probably test is, um, their 30 second power as well as, um, their two minute power. And a lot of people immediately go, what? Like two minutes, like that's way longer than a kilo. And, and the reason why I do that is with my elite guys, especially is you have to ride it twice. Um, and I kind of want to know what the exposure is after the minute and, and kind of what's happening to you, um, after a minute. And, and a lot of these guys that do these like specificity style training, they, they tend to start hard and finish slow. And what I need is a hard start and a steady finish. Um, it's going to hurt, but we need a steady finish. And so, so how do we look at that? And I guess w the way we would start that test is um, obviously a proper warm up into a couple, uh, couple good like six second sprints just to kind of open the system up a little bit. And then um, 10 to 15 minute rest, 30 second effort, 15 minute rest, two minute effort, cool down, shut it down. And then we go through our process of training, um, our work, our build, um, our exposure, um, I love, I love the term exposure is cause it's kind of like what you see, what you get to feel. Um, and then four to six weeks from then, um, we go and we look at it again and we see where we're at and, and, and what I actually look at, it's not actually the number as much as I look at the, the pink little fun line in training peaks the pacing or yeah, the pacing, like how, how does that look like? Because your actual power max might be lower, but you've extended the actual effort itself because you've learned how to expose yourself to that effort or how to how to come at that effort. And um, while a VO2 max effort is its max in the name, I think there is a sense of pacing to it. And I think there's a sense of training to that as well. And the sustained maximal effort is a thing. Um, yeah. No, I, and so that in the testing in, and in the training is something that we go over and we look at um, because sometimes I feel like that gets straight away from as well. To, to bring some context there, for, for those who may not know, track racing kilo um, is you race for a kilometer, right? And specific track race of sorts, it's all out. And I don't know, best in the world are... Dude, they're like 57 seconds now, man. It's nuts. It's They're not even at a minute anymore. You know, they start again, they start super hard and some of their last laps are slower than their first lap and they're starting from a standstill. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> so awesome. it is, but uh, yeah, it is pretty different. You need a lot of anaerobic juice to, uh, to do For something sure. like that. And, uh, For sure. my process when I'm working with say time crunched athlete is I still test. Uh, so I test all different power durations. I've gone over that on the podcast before, um, some sprints kind of uh, wake things up and I do a 30 to 60 second all out test to measure that anaerobic capacity. And when you and I were talking kind of off screen, um, you know, we were talking, I was like, I actually, I, I measure in FRC, which is kilojoules of work yeah. over FTP before that pink line on training peaks, right. Goes, goes for sure. Down. It, meaning they pace down, they get tired and it's a one-time effort. So I think going back to our quick definition or our like solid definition from scientific literature talking about its maximum amount of ATP in a short duration, maximum effort to matches in the matchbook to now we have a quantifiable showable measure of work and kilojoules from your power meter uh, approach of anaerobic marker. We can now talk about that mm -hmm. in FRC. And I think it's important to test that, especially with time confined athletes because they want to know that they're improving because they're not racing as much. Yeah. They're not, you know, the controllables are not as such on the group ride to where it's like, uh, I won it today, but like no one showed up. So maybe I'm getting better. Whereas for sure. Right. Whereas if your yeah. FTP is growing, 
and your FRC is growing, we know that there's high aerobic markers and high anaerobic markers to show that progression. Is that something that you do for as sure. well for the non-kilo uh, folk in your lineup? Yeah, no, for sure. And it's 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 not something that I dive dive mega deep into with with um, with certain athletes. And and the reason is is if I'm being honest, is it's more or less not to overcomplicate a situation. I get a little nervous sometimes like with I, obviously education, I think is key. And I think education and, and them knowing, okay, here's what you're being exposed to. Here's what's happening. Um, but the FRC, the FRC is, is the huge part of it, but I also don't want them to get to a point where um, like, okay, if I'm doing X FRC, I'm going to win bike race. Like, and, and so we make sure that, Hey, this is it. Here's, here's what we're testing. Here's what we're learning. It's the same with the power test too. And it's the mm-hmm. same. And this is why we had this kind of like weird conversation in the beginning of like, Oh, do you test athletes? And I got kind of nervous. I was like, Oh crap. No. Um, depends. It depends. Um, it, but really the main reason is, is because we're here to do an event and we're doing an event at an X amount of, of capacity. And what does that take to do that event? And this kind of goes back and, you know, me being a bigger athlete even. Um, but yes, I, I do look at the FRC, um, for, for athletes and, and mainly in their workouts, like how quick are they replenishing? Um, and, 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 and how quick is it bouncing back? Is it bouncing back? Um, and, um, as well as, as well as heart rate, um, especially my time crunched athletes. Um, like how is the heart heart responding to to the uh to the actual overall efforts like are they recovering well um and and sometimes you start to see this trend in the recovery um as their heart rate's not getting lower as we get towards the end and the power starts to go down yeah <laughs> and they're not able to produce yeah. the same right yeah. so the power is so, decaying and the heart rate is following suit yeah. and so the frc the frc for 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 me is is like the one metric ahead of the heart rate and and the reason why i say that is because i feel like the heart rate is the one that i can kind of kind of work with the athletes and exp- they can see that metric like oh wow like last week i did this and my heart rate was a little high while it is a big variable i will say that it is a big variable you could have a cup of coffee and your heart rate won't come mm-hmm. come down in 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 these recovery periods um but um that is one that I, I tend to try to look at um, earlier for for these guys when when we're breaking it down, um, and then I use the FRC for myself um, and in and, and tracking their training. If I'm being honest, yeah, yeah, it, you know, it's 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 still a complicated thing. It's not a uh, um, anything that any rider has or should have on their dashboard, you know, their cycling computer as they're going. But we're not looking at FRC. Um, I think it's a, it is a decent way of marking a capacity that we can yeah. measure over time. Uh, but like you said, like there's, there's tools and methods that we use as coaches to, to see the replenishment aspect of it. And that goes into the repeatability, uh, side of things. But I think to keep things as simple as possible, if your 30 second power is going up and you're pushing more Watts, your anaerobic capacity should follow suit with that. Am, am I exactly yeah. And that, like, yeah, exactly. To to like <laughs> overcomplicate things because all of these tools are what people are talking about, right? Um, oh yeah, right? oh yeah. I mean, core monitors. I mean, we sure. we can go all into into all of the uh, uh, the new hot tech Correct. that will make you faster. Correct. But I wanted to mention the things that actually matter, and then swing it back to yes. like, but still, it's power. Like it's it it is it is still as simple as that. And I don't think for, for listeners, sure. I don't think you need to get too far beyond that because um, when it comes to building anaerobic capacity, if you're pushing more watts in a short duration maximum effort, you are improving that. Well, I mean, just a quick touch. I mean, to to kind of go off like, yeah, the simplicity terms like watts and, and why I think FRC is like if we're going to use like one of these complicated metrics and, and one of these bigger metrics that can kind of like, it's, it's kind of like you could easily turn it into this like CTL. Like if my CTL is not 110, I'm not going to do well at Leadville right. or like my TSB says I'm, 
negative 10. So that means I can't do my workout today. Or my whoop score says this thing. You can go down this crazy trail, but FRC, the reason why I like FRC so much, we actually used FRC in, in with the national track program to dictate pool structure. Um, and so the team pursuit is a, is a four man, four man team on the track, four kilometers. You have to finish with three guys. Um, and it's about as simple as that. And it's, it's, uh, so that's 16 laps and in theory, right? You have all four guys go four laps, um, pull one lap, pull up, switch in the line. But then things started getting weird and we were like, oh, well we could use guys differently because we got different athletes here and me being a bigger guy, I had a high anaerobic capacity and I was a bigger dude. So I could, didn't really get a draft. And so my power never came down below to where I could start replenishing that FRC. So you were just like um, burning FRC right from the get go. And so literally off the line, FRC is starting to deplete. Now I had a, upwards of 40 kilojoules that could be used, um, which is pretty massive amount of SRC. And so I would pull for anywhere from six to seven laps, which is at that point, your third guy hasn't seen the front of the race in seven laps mm -hmm. and he's seeing half to go. He's almost halfway there. And so he's sat in line and recovered behind me in theory, mm -hmm. recovered um, behind me for the whole time. And, and that's, that's where those aerodynamics and, and things come into play and actually benefit the FRC, right? So you, you get that time to stay below this wattage, which allows you to essentially recover in line. Like Ashton Lambie would recover in line. It was the craziest thing. We would look at the data and we were just like, yeah, he needs to pull 11 laps because he's doing 290 watts behind John. Yeah. So for our listeners, again, who may not watch track racing or anything, so you got this four man race going, but because Krumi is the big boy, he can't hide, he can't draft as well. So put him on the front, burn all his energy off uh, using his um, his energy because they can drop one rider. And then meanwhile, Lambie, who's teammate, he's a smaller guy. He, he punches a smaller hole and he can hide behind somebody like John. So he's conserving um, he's saving his FRC or his matches for when, it, when the time comes. And that's the reality. And that's a very smart move on everybody's part to identify that and using FRC, uh, an anaerobic capacity marker in order to do that, to, uh, elicit a performance. And, and so there's like a good way, mm -hmm. I think FRC. And so like, you know, going back to me being like, Oh, don't overcomplicate it. Like we did. <laughs> Um, you definitely, you definitely can, and it's a, it's a good thing to do. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, um, if your power is better over 30 seconds than it was the first time, something's going right. Like something's happening. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, and the last thing I'll say about FRC is I don't mention it with all of my athletes. I, I, I monitor it and measure it with everyone, but I don't mention it because, hmm. But when I do is when you get these riders that have a, like really high aerobic capacity, say like a high FTP, let's just call it like yeah. 300 watts, but they can't sprint over 800. They have a low FRC. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I show them, we can improve, we can make you a better all around athlete, fast as fun, fun as fast by developing more anaerobic. It might take away from your aerobic. So FTP might come down, but we're going to get more anaerobic capacity out of the deal. So I show, show them the relationship and then we test and we go in some time. And like, and it's always like they produce more power here. They may see their FTP come down, but I say, look, but we improved your FRC by 20%. And then they feel in the group ride because the, say it starts hard and they're not depleted as much. And they're like, man, I, I can go, I can sprint at the end now. And that's one other like functional way of feeling what we're talking about in the, in the numbers when it comes to anaerobic capacity and FRC. The other, the other thing is too, I think in training, um, in these phases is you, you know, sometimes you get an athlete that has a high FRC and a low FTP and you might take them towards, take them towards that threshold route or take them towards, uh, building, building that engine more or less. And they will lose that FRC for sure. Um, it'll come down. I do think that FRC is a lot easier to find again and a lot easier to build than it is to build the FTP. So once you have that FTP foundation, um, taking the time to build that FRC, while it might take a little water from that cup there, 
and you'll overflow. Once you have that cup flowing over, then go back and you'll lose it. And eventually you'll start teeter tottering and, and coming back and forth. And they're both, your cups are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger um, is kind of the way I would look at that third cheesy, uh, cheesy method for methodology for the night from John Croom here, guys. Uh, yeah. That's when you know it's 10 o'clock in Spain. Yeah. So <laughs> I'd say, so it's 10 o'clock in Spain, but you hit the nail on the head with like, once you've got aerobic in FTP built and that cup is overflow it. Yeah. It's easy to build FRC. It's easy to build anaerobic capacity. How do you do it? What's give me a, a John Croom workout that you give to your athletes oh. that once the cup is overfloweth aerobically, you then start to pour into anaerobically. Yeah, I think we go. I, I think I go very easy. It depends on the athlete in the sense, but like I think a basic one is we go kind of a little easy in the system early days just to get the the quick exposure, and uh, I start with. 2040s um which is kind of a good good place to start um and we build from there um into either 30 30 40 is yeah yeah for for sure yeah um so 2040 would be 20 second max effort into a 40 second recovery i guess at like an active active recovery pace still pedaling kind of to clear the lactate um um, just kind of keep kicking it over and and you can do these in blocks of anywhere from like five ten minutes upwards you know, um, and then as we start to see progression in that, we would increase that closer to 30, 30 seconds on 30 seconds off, um, all the way into, uh, 45 seconds on 15 seconds off. Um, and then after that, I start to dive in to, you know, the one, two minute style efforts even. Um, and one of my favorite, like near the tail ends would be, like a three by three workout, which is three minutes on three minutes off. And and what we're shooting for there is I want the athlete to kind of look at every effort is like, okay, I got one three minute effort. They do the three minute effort. They give me their best effort. Then they go, okay, I have three minutes to recover. And then just taking it, taking it effort by effort, because sometimes you can look at that and it gets really scary. You're like, okay, I have six total efforts way above threshold. Um, and he's wanting a lot of me and he's wanting all of those efforts to be high. Um, and so I also say that when it starts to drop below threshold, shut it down. Mm -hmm. Like shut that's your effort that you're done because just as a reminder, like FTP or lactate threshold, that's a high aerobic or low anaerobic marker. It's that threshold of where you're no longer going anaerobic. And that's what John's talking about. Eh, it's pretty and, good and, indicator. And, shut her down. Cause you're not doing the work, the proper work. Anymore. Yeah. And this is where it gets kind of iffy, right? Because this goes back to my mental game, right? Like obviously you, you want that good mental exposure and you want to feel like you crushed that workout. You feel like you mastered that work. And honestly, if I gave you five, like if I said, you know, do five, three minute efforts or whatever, and you, the fourth one, you're just toast and you phoned it in and you're done. I would take that any day over you doing the zone, like, right at the tail end of the zone and just making them bang, bang, bang. And then your last one being like through the roof and like that happens. And it's a hard conversation to have because like, look, I smashed it. And you're like, yes, you did hundred percent. You smashed it, but I want you to flip it. I want you to smash that first one and let's start to see some of that exposure and some of that. And because the whole thought process is, is like, let's deplete that system and, and, and really get that exposure in. And then, in and more or less like with the mentality side of things is like you feel like you failed but in reality you completed the workout to its finest in my opinion like you've you've just executed exactly what we wanted um and you got exactly what you needed out of that workout and then hopefully the next week you're now doing five of them yeah. and that first one has a little bit more power yeah. and then and the next four or maybe just right there, but you were able to do all five and it's, that's when we're winning in my opinion. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think that, um, the important thing to keep in mind 
when we're talking about building anaerobic capacity is that is short-term maximal effort. So we don't want to see last interval max effort. Like we want to yeah. see the opposite because if we drain the tank, if we drain the purple line, the FRC, if we drain all energy out of your system, then if you rest and eat and do all the good things that we're you know, told to do as an athlete, your body will take that dose and respond to it in the way of building more capacity for later. And that's, that's the and, important part, but it has to be maximal. It has to be. For sure. And that's an, that's another good one. Uh, and, and I don't know if we were going to touch there on, you know, you made a comment about making sure you recover and these things is that because these are such high intense workouts, it's, it's such a high glycolytic response. So you want to make sure that you're eating during these efforts. And I know for some athletes, this can be kind of hard. And so you might have to play with it a little bit, whether you do it in, in, um, liquid form, gel form, gummy bears, solid food. It, it's, it's different for, it's kind of different for everyone, but you want to make sure you're kind of getting some carbohydrates in, um, to make sure that you're able to continue to keep producing these efforts because, you know, especially with you time crunched athletes, sometimes I have to get on top of you guys because you guys are getting up at like four in the morning to crush your workouts and you're not having breakfast and you're smashing these three by threes and you're wondering why your power is so low and you feel so flat and literally you haven't eaten since eight o'clock when you went to bed because you knew you had to wake up at four to do a workout, you know? And um, so there are, there are some tricks to, executing the workout fueling wise as well, um, which we could dive into, but, um, but yes, that's, that's something that I would, I really recommend making sure that you're properly fueled for these kind of efforts. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good reminder. And, uh, I, I feel like I have pressed upon, uh, the time crunched audience several times about fueling properly for high intensity exercise. So we don't need to go super down the road there, but the thing I would also, yeah, no um, add to that is show up fresh. So if, if yes. your coach prescribes some of these 30 thirties, for example, um, and you had poor night's sleep and it's Wednesday and you got that hard workout and you're like, Ooh, I feel like dirt. Just text your coach, say, I slept like crap. Can we do them Thursday? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, it, it's, it, again, it's, it's one of those mentality things, um, that, that, that you kind of have to own. And if you honestly, if you take that anything from this, these, these conversations in this podcast is that, um, kind of just trusting yourself, trusting your body a little bit. And even if you don't trust yourself, that's what you got us for. You shoot us a message and be like, Hey, I'm thinking this, is this an okay thought? <laughs> you know, like, should I shut it down? Should I not shut it down? Um, or I did shut it down. Was that the right thing to do? Um, and, and yeah, there's, there's always that way to have that conversation of, Hey, you know, you didn't sleep well. Or, and that's usually why, like when I'm doing the VO2 stuff, I do it on your, like all the, all the workouts are around either a recovery day, full rest day, um, or an active recovery day to make sure you get the most out of that athlete. And I think for the self-coach athletes too, as you're on your journey of figuring it out, tune into your body too, because if you have that poor night's sleep, right? If stuff went sideways at work and the meetings came up, you didn't get lunch and it's six 30 at night and you're like, okay, time to smash this Tabata style workout. It probably ain't going to go well. So just kick it to the next day. Um, yeah. Last, cause we talked about some of those workouts, John, just for the 30 30s. Yeah. Um, my advice on those is like, first of all, you, you said you can do like five blocks of them of around five minutes. So if we're doing like 30 30s, 30 seconds on 30 seconds off for five minutes, easy recovery for five ish minutes and then repeat, or how would you structure that again? Uh, and I'm not to be nitpicky, but it also depends on the athlete, but yeah, usually, and, and sometimes, sometimes I, I kind of roll the dice with different people. Like I'll start with around five minutes and some people would be like, Hey, I didn't have enough recovery or, um, they felt like they, and, 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 and we may shut it down to around, you know, even to a 10 minute, recovery, but I think anything past 10 minutes is a little too much depending on the length of the block. Um, and so what I was saying is that it would be like a five minute block and, and you would do anywhere from 
probably I, with most of my most of my athletes we don't really go past four blocks i don't i don't tend to do do five blocks um four blocks is a pretty heavy like 30 i mean that's 20 total minutes i agree with that and i think it that shapes up the intensity which i wanted to speak to because yes it's maximum and it's hard it's yes. it, we're not doing and i sometimes call these speed intervals but like everybody's person and this is where it depends as well what percentage or what power should i hit all out hard mm, yeah Full send. like use perceived yeah. effort yeah. I, you know with your in, with a coach or if you're monitoring your data you can get a little bit more scripted but like i don't really even prescribe power on these i'm just i don't yeah i i don't like doing it with zwift um and some some of these athletes you kind of have to make sure you got them taken care of um because they like to put it into the zwift zwift program um and so that's why i usually prescribe power but it's always in the description that like give me the most that you have i think on the recovery side of things just to get back to that and kind of clear that up too is 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 um with with the recovery um i i kind of leave it open-ended a little bit because the 30 really the 30 30 like when you're doing the 30 seconds on 30 seconds off 30 seconds on that's the effort okay and it's not it's not like you know when you do a, a 10 minute on 10 minute off 10 minute on 10 minute off that's the effort like that's that's the effort that you're doing so those recoveries in between those blocks are actually just getting you ready for the next effort and so we're not i'm not utilize i'm not trying to shorten that recovery in between to intensify the exposure i guess in the next effort i'm trying to freshen you up to make sure that next effort is ma- like yeah. that's it's worth doing oh, that's good content. um and we're not we're not having to shut it down early. So I want to make sure that I say that right. Because sometimes I feel like the athletes over, they get, they get kind of stressed out about the recovery in between. They're like, Oh, I took an extra minute here. I, or I didn't, I didn't take enough. I took like three minutes and I went straight into it or I, you know, or I just tried to get the workout in and I rushed it or whatever. Um, I just want to make sure that the recovery, while it is important, but it's more or less important to make sure that we're optimizing for the next effort and then that recovery inside that effort yes is important because of what's coming next if that makes no, sense. it makes complete sense and i think the be- the best way to sum summarize that is when we're doing intensive training like this versus extensive like if we're trying to go for long it's a different story if we're trying to intensify workout if we're trying to build anaerobic capacity i would rather take higher power and higher effort and let your recovery be what it is in order to achieve that high power and high effort for the next time. So for sure. For sure. Um, so that's, you know, that is the repeatability aspect of building some anaerobic capacity. I just want to mention too, when I'm building absolute power, I'll go with a workout that is like four or four or five or six by 30 second effort maximum all out with. Yep. 15 ish minutes, easy pedaling in between something like that. Um, yeah. And I'll even lengthen that out, but yeah, it's basically four to six max effort, full tilt eyes, bleeding 30 second efforts. And we we've been over 90 minutes or so. Well, and some of those are really good. I, I mean, going back to the self coach athletes and some of the time crunch guys, like when we're, when we're saying, Hey, you want to be really fresh for these VO two workouts. And like some of these high, like intensity, like two minutes on two minutes off, like by eight, or if you do the 30 thirties and you do big blocks of them, or you do, you know, 45 fifteens or, you know, you want to be super fresh for those, but in your maintenance day, like, let's say on Tuesday, like you do that on Monday and then on Tuesday and like in your, you do like a two hour endurance, ride, Or you do an hour endurance, ride. it would be a good time to like throw in like three 15 second sprints. Mm-hmm like in eyes bleeding sprints, like they're going to be hard. And it's, so it's not actually like a recovery day, but it gives you the opportunity to get that just little bit more exposure. And then, then you go into that rest state. So then you can do the next set of VO2, get that VO2 exposure that you're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. And then finally, just to kind of wrap all this up, I probably, when we're doing intensive workout like this or an intensive block of training, I probably only have three days most during the week and the rest is endurance or recovery would you yeah absolutely yeah absolutely and that's kind of why i was saying like because you kind of have to be careful with with 
you know, overloading those two by two minutes and things like that. But if you want to get some of, cause I, I wouldn't ever like, I, I maybe would do those 30, 30 blocks or having those max, um, those like three minute, four minute efforts. Um, but I wouldn't, I would never do like more than, more than, uh, two days a week of that kind of style. But going back to that three second, 15 second max, exactly. Because you can kind of do those a little fatigued and I'm not stressed about it. Um, it, because then you're just doing like active pedaling between it and, and re- more or less recovering. Um, and then your weekends or what have you, you're kind of getting that just endurance ride, that endurance maintenance, keeping that and uh, keeping that aerobic system topped off. Yeah, that, that's a good way to describe it. Because I originally had like in my notes, I'm like, oh, I only do two days of this. But when you mentioned the sprint day, I was like, oh, yeah, I do that. And it's and it's an anaerobic day, but it's it's not a deep one. And I feel like, because yeah. you're smiling, but I feel like like anaerobic people like you, when I'm coaching athletes like you, I t- if I give them kind of a free day like that, where it's just like, yeah, work in these sprints. Dangerous. Dangerous because you just licking your Abs- chops. Absolutely. And, and I have one texting me right now <laughs> who, like, he goes on, I'm like, hey, just do an active recovery ride. And he does like 10, 10 second sprints max. And he's like, dude, I did 1900 watts today. And you're just like, oh my gosh. Okay. And it's like, it, make sure, I guess, if you take anything, you know, I know you're trying to wrap this up, but if you take anything from this podcast, it's like, make your hard days hard, make your rest days even harder, man. Like, and that's how your hard days will be like, they'll just keep getting better and better and better. But I, I do find, like I said, like, uh, go ahead and, and give your athlete or give yourself like one day just to like sprint and, and, and whoop it up for it's sure. Just, it's not recovery. Don't call it recovery. If you sprint in your recovery for days, sure. I just want to, you're silly. Like, oh no, and, and that's kind of, that's kind of my secret trick is like, Hey, do, do three 15 second efforts and it's the day after it's the day after you did those hard efforts um where you might not necessarily need a recovery day but you don't have enough time to go put in put in miles and then at the same time you know i don't really want you do i think you're going to be a little fatigued to be doing you know even muscle you know muscle tension or tempos or whatever and maybe maybe tempos but it's just it just doesn't feel right fully um yeah. and so yeah yeah yeah, man. Well, this has been good. I mean, we, we could clearly talk for hours and hours, but you got to get to bed. Uh, I got to get on with my day, but uh, Kroom, thanks, man. Thanks for taking time hey. and hey, talking on the uh, Time Crunch Cyclist podcast. I think everybody's really going to enjoy uh, these two episodes. So thank you. Always, man. I'm looking forward to hearing it. All right.